Welcome to Meeple Mentor. I'm Jared, and we're about to play Spectre the board game. Let's take a look. I'll show you how. Feel free to pause the video as needed to follow along with your copy of the game. My goal is this video can not only teach you to play, but can be shown at the game table to help set up and teach the game at your next game session. As part of that goal, I've added chapter timestamps in the description to the different sections of the tutorial to easily recap relevant rules for you. Make sure to subscribe and hit the notification bell below the video so you don't miss any of my latest content. Become one of the top villains in the Spectre Villainous Organization in the Spectre board game based on the James Bond 007 film franchise. You'll find iconic villains from many of the Bond movies, each with their own abilities and plot motivations inspired by their films. Compete to become number one, advancing your threat and infamy over a series of rounds. Deploy your agents around the world, spy, blackmail, and infiltrate key installations during the game. Of course, to succeed in your evil missions and plots, you'll need to avoid 007 foiling your plans, and even other players. Let's look first at how to set up the game. To start setting up, place the main game board in the middle of the table. The 007 chip token and the dice can sit at the bottom right of the board over the 007 description. Put the majority tokens on the table next to the game board. Find the mission card named On Her Majesty's Secret Service and set it aside. Shuffle all the other mission cards and pull six. Reshuffle these and place them face down into a deck on the mission card slot at the bottom of the board. Now put the set aside mission on top of the deck. Put the three resource token types out on the board in their designated spots for them. There's gold, intel, and blueprints. Shuffle the secret plan cards and deal one to each player. Then put the deck face down in its location on the board. The secret plans are kept face down and secret from other players, but you may look at them anytime. Let each player choose a villain to be from among the five choices, or you could randomize it. Each player takes the villain's board and puts it in front of them on the table. Everyone chooses a color to be from the four available and gains the villain and henchman pawns, 20 agent tokens, and Spectre Track Marker. If any player is playing as Rosa Kleb, they gain one extra secret plan card to start the game with. Each player rolls both dice and adds the values. A gun barrel result counts as a zero. The player with the highest rolled result becomes number one in the organization to start. Second highest rolled gets number two, and so on. However, if anyone is playing as the villain Ernst Blofeld, they automatically start the game as number one. Players should grab the folded name plaque for their number and put it in front of them. Then arrange everyone's Spectre tokens in a stack at the first base on the track. Arrange them so player number one is on top with others below in numerical order. Players should now take as many scheme tokens to cover the square schemes found on their villain board. It could be three or four depending on the villain. Put them with the blocking side face up. With that, you're set up and ready to play. The goal of the game is to be number one in the Spectre organization at the end of the game. Typically, the game will last seven rounds tracked by the setup mission card deck. However, the villain Emilio Largo can prematurely end the game by finalizing his scheme, Drop the Bomb. During the game, players can advance on the Spectre track by infiltrating certain regions, winning missions, completing secret plans, and using character special abilities. Once the final round is over, players in current number order will get to reveal all their leftover secret plan cards to determine how many are completed. After all players have done this and advanced along the Spectre track one final time, you'll see who won. The player who advanced the furthest wins. The player's token who's on top would break a tie for being ahead. A single round of the game progresses through the following steps each time. First, number one draws the top mission card from the deck and reads it out loud fully to everyone. Then they can put it face up on top of the deck to indicate it's the current round's mission. Next, players who are number two and number four gain their advantages shown on their name plaque. Number two gains one free resource of their choice from the reserve, and number four advances one space on the Spectre track. 
Next, players take turns placing their villain pawn on action spaces possible for villains. This goes in number order as established at the start of the round. After everyone's placed and resolved their villain action, players now place their henchman pawns out on valid action spaces for them in number order again. Actions are resolved as soon as a player puts their pawn out. Next, majority control of the main regions of the board are checked. Agent cubes in players' colors in a region are compared to opponents to see who controls the region. The regions are checked from left to right, starting with the one labeled 2. Whoever has the majority of agents gains the majority token for that region and places it in front of them. No one gains the majority if a tie. If tied, the majority token returns to the table beside the board. When gaining the majority token, the player also immediately gains the area majority bonus effect of that region. It's the darker green area where the region number is. After region majorities are resolved, players check if they can complete the mission card together. A short bidding round happens where players can contribute their resources to help complete the mission. Whoever is number three gets to keep two of their bid resources. Then, number one will roll both 007 dice and resolve the roll. They may re-roll one of the two dice, but must keep the new result. Next, players retrieve their villain and henchman pawns from their placed locations. Emilio Largo, however, does not retrieve his villain at this step as part of his ability. Lastly, the new specter numbers of the organization are re-evaluated. Redistribute the number name plaques to players based on their standing on the specter track. This concludes a single round of the game. Let's take a look now at what makes up the villain boards and schemes. Then, a quick review of the name plaque bonuses while being a specific number. Each villain board shows their name at the top with a quote and a picture of them from their movie at the top right corner. The top left of the board describes their ongoing scheme bonus during the game. Below that are the two villain board action spaces that pawns can be placed for special actions. Each villain board has the finalized scheme action, plus one unique to them. Across the bottom are the various schemes that are available to them once paid for and unlocked. Some villain boards have a carrot arrow pointing to the right between schemes. This means the previous scheme to the left must be unlocked first before that one can. The costs to unlock any scheme is given below it with a number of resources from the three in the game. To unlock one, they must place one of their pawns on the finalized scheme action during the round to pay the required resources and remove the blocking token. Some schemes are instant actions that trigger one time as soon as it is unlocked. You'll know them by the large lightning bolt icon in the center. Sometimes the blocking token will be flipped over due to a visit from 007. This increases the cost to finalize the scheme by two resources. Any two resources can be used. Once a scheme is unlocked, it is available and active for the rest of the game. Some schemes have a new action space printed in them. This means players can assign one of their pawns there during the round to activate the printed ability. Some action spaces are for specific pawns, shown by the shape of the action space. The circles are for villains, squares for henchmen, and when both are present like this, either could go there. The shapes match the bases of the player's pawns. All the actions found on the main game board are like this. Either pawn can go there. The unlocked villain actions on their board can also be triggered for free without using a pawn whenever their specter marker advances onto or past a red specter gear space on the track. The red spaces don't let you activate one-time effect schemes. Whenever there's an action or event that triggers other actions like this, make sure to fully resolve the first before moving on to the next. Since you're playing as Bond Villains and Specter, players will be labeled by their numbered rank in the organization. Yes, you have villain names, but it's more on theme to refer to each other by your numbers. You'll be reinforcing your position in the group. Of course, if you're number four, you may want to assert yourself and refer to players by their villain names instead of their number. The name plaques in front of you remind everyone which number you are in the hierarchy. They are also used to determine player order when placing pawns. The plaques also describe the actions and responsibilities you have while you're that number in the organization. Number one has the responsibility of drawing the mission card at the start of the round and reading it to everyone. They are also the one to roll the 007 dice and may re-roll one of them. Right after number one reads the mission card, number two gets to take one free resource of their choice from the supply. 
Number three has the benefit of keeping two of their bid resources after bidding on mission resolutions. Number four gets to advance for free one space forward on the Spectre track after number one reads the mission card. Remember, this could also cause them to activate one of their villain board actions for free if moving onto a red Spectre space. Let's look more closely at the other aspects of the game round. After the mission card is read and numbers 2 and 4 gain their benefits, players take turns placing villain pawns, then henchmen pawns. Let's talk about the actions found on the game board. Each action space can only be occupied by one pawn at a time, and they stay in their spots until the end of the round. The exception here is Aristotle Christatos, whose ability lets him ignore other villain pawns when placing his villain. Additionally, Emilio Largo's ability prevents him from picking up his villain at the end of a round, so on his villain pawn turn, he simply moves it to a new empty space to take actions. The only exception is if his villain pawn is used to complete a mission card, his pawn returns to him at the end of that round instead of staying on the mission discard pile. Each of the regions has an action space for pawns, which gains the player an immediate region bonus. Additionally, just by placing your pawn in a region, you get to add one agent from your supply to that region. At region 2, gain two blueprints from the supply. Keep all collected resources in front of you to be able to be spent later. At region 3, you can place an agent from your supply to either region 3, 7, or 8. At Region 4, you can pay any one resource to move forward one space on the Spectre track. Region 5's bonus gives you two gold resources. At Region 6, put one of your agents from your supply at Region 2, 3, or 4. Region 7 also lets you place an agent, but only at Regions 4, 6, or 7. Region 8 gives you two intel resources. Getting as many agents in the regions as possible is important, as this will allow you to gain the region's majority bonus in the next phase, i.e. after all pawns are placed. Each region on the map represents a different criminal activity or operation supported by the Spectre organization. In each region, the player with the most agent cubes gains the majority. They take the majority token in front of them for that region's number, then gain the majority bonus for that region. If there's a tie, the majority token returns to the table and no one gets it. The majority tokens are meant to help players recall which majorities they own. Some villains use them as part of their schemes or abilities, plus some secret plans require them to be spent. Calculate the majorities from left to right, starting with North America. The majority bonus for Region 2 is to move one of your deployed agents on the board to a different region. This can affect majority in the next regions to be resolved. Region 3's majority bonus gives you two gold resources. Region 4 gives you two blueprints. Region 5 lets you advance one space on the Spectre track. Remember that if you land on the red space, you can activate one of your villain board actions for free as long as it's unlocked. Region 6 gives you one resource of your choice from the supply. Region 7 gives you two intel resources. Region 8 lets you move up to three of your agents from any region to any other region. They don't need to come from the same region, nor move to the same region. After resolving the majorities, the current round's mission card will try to be resolved. The missions represent ploys of the organization to achieve world domination. Villains should contribute in order to gain advancements. Players can discuss how much they want to contribute to completing the mission, but lying is acceptable and even encouraged. Missions must have a number of mission points contributed to them in order to be successful, plus at least one resource contributed to it. The number needed is always the same regardless of the card. It's based on player count. In a two-player game, all missions need six points to succeed. Three-player games need eight mission points. Four-player games need ten points. If a mission fails, all players suffer the negative consequence found on the bottom of the card. For example, one of the missions from You Only Live Twice causes players to immediately go back one space on the Spectre track. In this case, any player whose token is sitting on one of the red Spectre spaces is protected from the movement backwards. It's an extra benefit of having your token there. Sometimes a mission's failure consequences apply to the following round. Keep it face up in the pile next to the mission deck. For example, failing this Skyfall mission card prevents players from using their henchman pawns in the next round. The Enforcer's term was a misprint on the card. Any villains who contributed at least one point to it get to draw a new secret plan card. 
The player or players who contributed the most towards the mission has the chance to complete a secret plan immediately and advance one space on the Spectre track. When tied players advance on the Spectre track, the player lowest in hierarchy advances first. There are two kinds of mission card objectives to meet to succeed the mission. A round of bidding out resources will happen if the mission can succeed. One kind of mission objective is to have one player place their villain pawn on the card itself instead of taking a regular action. If no one had done this, the mission automatically fails during this phase. The player who placed their pawn here counts as having contributed three points towards the success of the mission. It's not automatically successful as the group still needs to meet the minimum points required. Another kind of mission objective is to collectively have villain agents in a specific region. At least one agent must be in that region to not auto-fail. Each agent in the specified region counts as one mission point. The very first mission of the game, On Her Majesty's Secret Service, is a unique objective since it doesn't specify a region. Agents in any region on the map can contribute to this mission. After quickly assessing if the mission is possible, because there's at least one agent in the region named or a villain is placed on the card, you'll proceed to bidding to complete the mission. Players will secretly place a number of resources in their hand to bid towards adding more mission points to the mission. The mission card will specify which resource or resources can be used to complete the mission. The first mission can accept any resource type. No matter the mission or current point standing, at least one resource needs to be bid to succeed the mission. Additionally, anyone playing as Blofeld has the unfair advantage ability to use any resource in the bid. Each resource contributed will add one mission point to the completion of the mission card. Once everyone's chosen what to bid, if any, everyone puts their closed fist in the middle of the table, then reveals simultaneously. Add up everyone's point contributions from bid resources, including the three points for the villain pawn placed on the mission card, or any agents in the named region. If the group has collectively contributed enough mission points to meet the points threshold needed for your player count, the mission succeeds. If not, it fails. All contributed resources are discarded to the supplies except for the villain player number three. They get to keep two of their bid resources. You can now move the current mission card to the discard pile next to the deck. Remember to enforce the failure penalty on the card if the mission failed. Keeping it on the discard pile for the next round will help remind players of any ongoing penalty that applies for the next round. After resolving the current mission card, number one will have to roll the two 007 dice. James Bond is traveling the world and rooting out where the villains have invested their energy and resources. He's doing everything in his power to foil their plans. The dice represent this. Number one may choose one of the rolled dice to re-roll and keep the final result. There's three possible outcomes to the dice roll. If a double barrel roll result, then each player removes one of their agents from each region. The 007 chip is removed from any region and returns to his board description area. If both dice are numbers, add them together and place the 007 token on the region of the map corresponding to that number. Remove all agents and pawns from that region. As long as his token is in a region, villain players cannot place agents or pawns there. The third outcome of a roll is if a single barrel is rolled along with a number. Then the player represented by that number gets to choose another villain for 007 to visit. If not playing a 3 or 4 player game, a rolled result of barrel and 4 refers to player 1, while a barrel and 3 refers to player 2. Put the 007 token near the targeted opponent's villain board. James Bond causes one of that opponent's scheme tokens to flip over, increasing the cost for them to be able to unlock and finalize it. The numbered player who was rolled gets to choose, not the targeted player. It remains face up on the board and will be worth less Spectre advancements when completed. Now that villain sends 007 away to a region of their choice on the map. He once again removes all agents from that region and prevents players from going there or adding agents until he's gone. Finally, let's talk about the secret plan cards. These are great ways to increase your standing in the Spectre organization. Each card has objectives above and below the middle of the card. Both must be met to achieve it. The green Spectre image in the corner shows you how many advances you gain on the track when you complete the plan. However, if 007 has forced you to reveal the plan, you can only gain the advancements in the red image. That's the price for giving up information. There's generally two ways to complete them. 
Firstly, if you contribute the most to a mission, you have the ability to complete one of your secret plans. Secondly, every player will get to try to complete all secret plans in their possession at the end of the game. Players score them in number order. Rosa Klebb has the Lecter device scheme, which is a special action available to her that lets her complete a secret plan as an action with a pawn. The scheme must, of course, be finalized first. To follow through with completing a plan, follow these steps. Any resources or tokens required must be spent exclusively for a single plan as required. You can't allocate them to completing different plans at the same time. If the plan requires resources, spend resources from your collection matching the requirements. Some plans require you to have in your possession the majority token for a specific region. You must have it and spend it back to the table beside the game board. If the plan asks you to have a certain number of majority tokens, it won't matter which regions they belong to. Spend as many as needed from your collection back to the table. Secret plans can require you to have finalized one or more schemes. The scheme tokens must be spent for that cost. Return them to the game box as part of the payment. Some secret plans will require your villain or henchman to be present in a specific region. They must be there when trying to complete the plan. Other requirements could be to have a number of agents in a specific region. After paying anything required, advance your Spectre token the number of spaces shown on the card. Remember to use the red number if the plan was revealed, i.e. face up in front of you instead of face down. Note that when completing your secret plans at the end of the game and you move your token past a red Spectre space, do not activate a villain action. Whoever has advanced the furthest along the Spectre track after scoring all secret plans wins. In a tie, whoever's token is on top wins. Keep the rulebook handy and check BoardGameGeek.com for FAQs and extra content. The Meeple Mentor channel is now part of the board game community, The Gateway Network, made up of great upcoming board game content creators. The network includes Instagrammers, podcasters, YouTubers, artists, and more. Head to thegatewaynetwork.com to check them out. Thank you for watching this tutorial. Like and subscribe if you found this teaching helpful. Stick around to watch another Learn to Play video. And remember, teach when you can, but always be learning. See you next time.